In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3 has some very famous lyrics. There's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to dance and a time to mourn. I say lyrics because we know of it as a song, right? Turn, turn, turn. The premise behind Ecclesiastes is that everything is part of the natural course of events. We're born, we die, we celebrate, we laugh, we cry. These days we are not living in natural times. And what is happening is not natural. This past Yom Kippur, I spoke about the complicated relationship between Israel and the global Jewish people. Here is a quote from that speech. In my lifetime, post Yom Kippur War, Israel has not been under existential threat from invading armies. Its three greatest dangers today are Iranian nuclear weapons, trying to swallow the West Bank and choking on it, and suicide by civil war. That was a bold statement that has not aged particularly well. Today, both Israel and the global Jewish people face existential threats. We have to talk about them. We also have to decide how serious they really are and respond appropriately. I think of it like the immune system. I have environmental allergies. And what that means is that my immune system is trying to kill all the trees that are out there. Because the tree pollen comes in and the immune system says, kill, kill, kill. And I sneeze <laughs> and my eyes water and I have problems. But of course, an immune system that doesn't respond at all allows an infection to run rampant. And that can also have dire, dire consequences. We have to diagnose the problem and we have to prescribe the correct level of response. When I spoke those naive words at the end of September, there was a fourth danger. It was not anticipated by me. It was not anticipated by the Israeli army or their intelligence services either, so I don't feel that bad about my mistake. And that fourth existential threat is an Iranian axis of evil with Hamas in the south and Hezbollah in the north. On October 7th, there was a bloody invasion and a pogrom by Hamas coming from Gaza. It killed, I think, 1,200 mostly Israeli civilians, kidnapped over 300 more. A number of soldiers were killed. And since then, ongoing rocket fire from Gaza and from South Lebanon has caused 250,000 Israelis to leave their homes and become internal refugees. That is unlivable as a new status quo, an ongoing threat of bloody massacre and ongoing rocket fire reaching all over the country. That is an existential threat. And so Israel is fighting back. For weeks, they bombarded Gaza to hit rocket launchers and bunkers. They responded to Hezbollah rockets in the north. Israel mobilized hundreds of thousands of reservists to cover both fronts, and they shut down normal life to deal with this crisis. The university term was scheduled to start after the end of the holiday of Sukkot. It's been postponed to December because 30% of the students are in the reserves now. The judicial protest organizers that had been running week after week with hundreds of thousands of people, they switched on a dime to volunteering to help those evacuees, even volunteer farming on evacuated kibbutzim to harvest the cabbage. Now, because Hamas operates in civilian areas, often hiding their tunnel entries, their bunkers, their command centers and weapons caches near hospitals and mosques and apartment buildings and refugee camps, the challenge is to hit those legitimate targets of bunkers and caches without killing civilians. And that weapon has not yet been invented. So we have produced thousands of civilian casualties. And I will, I will point out, I very rarely have seen in any news stories a delineation of Palestinian casualties between how many are civilians and how many are Hamas fighters, militants, etc. Now, you know, will we ever know? Probably not. The agency giving us the numbers is the Palestinian Health Agency in Gaza run by Hamas. Now, we do also know that those numbers may be an underestimate because they're not going around checking the rubble. My guess is as time goes on, as that rubble gets cleared, 
there will be more bodies that are found than those declared even now. Even so, the problem is that children are children, and the death of a child is the death of a child. I heard a line attributed to, I think, Naomi um, Wolf, uh, who was active in the Socialist Party at the time, and she said, socialism is about being against the gun and for the child. And it doesn't matter whose gun, and it doesn't matter whose child. And so there's that sentiment there, that any child's death is terrible, even if a terrorist is hiding behind the child to launch a rocket into an Israeli city. And so that's another challenge. It's clearly devastating what's happening in Gaza, no matter what the real numbers are or what the division is. And what's an appropriate proportion? If it's one quarter militants and three quarters civilians, is that better? If it's half and half, is that okay? These are impossible, impossible math problems. In theory, the Jewish community and Israel itself today faces a strategic debate. Do they, one, continue to push the fight against Hamas with the advantage they've achieved so far to continue on to wipe out bunkers to kill Hamas fighters? Two, do they create what they're calling a humanitarian pause, give civilians a chance to leave, even if some Hamas fighters may sneak out? Do you create humanitarian breathers for a day or two, even if that gives Hamas a chance to plot further actions and regroup? Or do you declare a ceasefire, as some have promoted? Ceasefire now, you'll see the protests around, you'll hear people chanting at protests. They want to stop all the killing. There was killing on one side, there's killing on the other side. Stop the killing, they say. But of course, if there's a ceasefire, then Hamas doesn't just escape, Hamas survives. And what does that do? You know, if you don't get the cancer, it comes back. This is not just a strategic question these days. It's a political question, and it's a moral question too. And it impinges on how we relate to each other as a Jewish community. You hear the line, either you're with us or you're against us. And unless you're with us with exactly what we want to do, you're against us. I saw a headline today in Haaretz, which is one of the most progressive newspapers in Israel. It's like the New York Times equivalent there. And the headline from an op-ed columnist was, these are the Jews who joined the Jew baiters. He's talking about those Jewish groups calling for a ceasefire. You're the enemy because you're making common cause with the enemy to stop us from killing our enemy, Hamas. This week marked 30 days, that Shloshim mourning period, and we're beginning to look forward, just as when we get up from the period of mourning, we look forward to a life without the person we've lost. Now. We have to face the implications of this crisis, the new reality that we understand, these existential fears looking us in the face, both in Israel and around the Jewish world. I want to look at three of them in Israel and three of them for the rest of us. In Israel, the existential threat right in their face at the moment is a multi-front war. This is what Hamas hoped. They wanted a war in Gaza and a full-out assault from the north by Hezbollah with rockets and invasion there and a full uprising in the West Bank and possible involvement from other Arab countries as well. That's what they wanted, but it hasn't been fulfilled. Yes, there is the full-scale war in Gaza and Hamas continues to send rockets out, but there's a low simmer in the north. There's a few rockets here, a few rockets there. It, it means the people have to leave and Hezbollah can claim they're doing something. But on the scale of what Hezbollah could do, it's, to use a technical term, bupkis, compared to what they could be doing. And the West Bank is also on kind of a low simmer, has not exploded, and there are occasional rockets from Yemen, you know, that's not what they were hoping for, is the random drone from Yemen making it to a lot in the south of Israel. Hezbollah and the Houthi rebels in Yemen are sponsored by Iran as is Hamas, that's that axis of evil surrounding Israel. But they have not really made a dent on the battlefield except in Gaza. Even if there's no imminent threat of total destruction though, there is an existential fear. One is that Israel can't live in this situation forever with 250,000 displaced people and no economy and 
no university studies because a third of the students are in the arm. It's not sustainable in the long term. And the only reason it was sustainable before was a concept of deterrence. Hezbollah didn't shoot rockets because Israel would smush them. Gaza didn't invade and Hamas didn't invade or shoot more rockets because of the deterrent factor of what would happen in response. And if Israel does not have that deterrent, if Hamas is fanatical enough to risk what it risks, or Hezbollah doesn't care and feels that Hamas and Iran have its back, it's not livable. There are rockets still hitting Tel Aviv on day 35. And if that's the reality, it's not livable. Second existential challenge for Israel is Israel's positions in the world. We've seen in European capitals and in the Arab capitals in even greater numbers, protests on behalf of the Palestinians. Now, some of those protests are, I would say, well-meaning protests. Those true peaceniks who want a ceasefire to stop the killing. We saw Jewish groups take over the US Capitol with that message and at the Statue of Liberty as well, just recently. Now, you may say they're naive, but they're doing it from a good place. Some of those protests, though, are not doing it from a good place. They've crossed the line into anti-Semitism. They've justified the massacre of innocent civilians. They're endorsing Hamas. I mean, one of the strangest posters you'll ever see is a picture of someone with purple hair with a poster saying, queers for Hamas. Hamas isn't for the queers, to use that phrase. They get thrown off of buildings, they get killed. I mean, what are you rooting for here? A fundamentalist dictatorship? They're not on your side. And then we find the pushing of a slogan to the end of its line. We'll talk about two slogans here. One is, by any means necessary. The argument is that the oppressed population can resist the oppressive power, the colonialist, by any means necessary. Well, what took place on October 7th was any means. I don't think it's necessary, but it was stretching the limits of that. If you can accept that, what was done on October 7th, then you truly accept by any means necessary, but then you're not civilized. Then I think you don't have morals because you have no limits in the pursuit of your fanatical goal. We've even seen in support of this by any means necessary, the denial of the means that were used you know, we live in a post-truth world where anything can be done by AI, and so anything that really happens is thought to be AI if you don't like it. So some people imagine that the Israeli army killed all those people to make the Palestinians look bad, just like the Mossad ran planes into 9-11, or crisis actors played the dead children at Sandy Hook, or nobody really landed on the moon. I mean, this is the world of denial we live in, and it's being applied to this as well. I didn't see pictures of babies with their heads cut off, so it didn't happen. And then when you see them, it must be made up. Because it's hard to admit that the person on your side, the freedom fighter you're rooting for, could break morals so explicitly. But the problem is that this is part of what's happening outside of Israel that makes Israel worried. If, if we can't get sympathy with this, Maybe we can't get sympathy at all. But it goes one step further. Right now, there is still support from Western governments for the Israeli military response against Hamas. After all, it does undercut Iran too, which the US is happy to see happen. But how long will it last as the conflict in Gaza goes on and civilian casualties increase? And the other slogan we've seen at these protests, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Now, to hear Rashida Tlaib explain it, this is a statement looking for relieving the oppression of the oppressed, creating a kumbaya community of freedom and justice for all. Now, it depends what you mean, because Hamas uses the same slogan. And when Hamas uses the slogan, they mean it will be Jew-free. Or if there are Jews there, as they said about 10 years ago, they can live under the banner of Islam. That means they can be a subordinate minority. They can go back to the world of the Middle Ages where Jews had to keep their synagogues low and not blow their shofars too loud and face rit ritual degradation. That Hamas would accept, but an independent state of Israel, no way, impossible. 
And the problem with the slogan, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is that it's erasing Israel. It's calling the land Palestine as if there can be no Israel for the people to be free. Now, if the slogan were slightly tweaked, from the river to the sea, all people will be free. From the river to the sea, Palestine and Israel, it doesn't chant very well, but you could say both names and the countries, and then it would work. It, you'd be affirming both. You would affirm all people as citizens of one country. Fine. But to say the only free country would be called Palestine with that flag is to erase Israel. Whether you want the people to stay or to leave is separate. And I don't think Rashida Tlaib wants to kill all the Jews that live in Israel or from the river to the sea. I'll point out, by the way, that from the river to the sea was also part of the original platform of the Likud party, which is Benjamin Netanyahu's party, because they wanted one state from the river to the sea. They just wanted it to be Israel. And there are members of his coalition who would have no problem pushing Palestinians out. So they would want a Palestine free or a Palestinian free from the river to the sea. So there are extremists on both sides that want to use this. But when this slogan is chanted, I understand some of the people using it mean well. They don't mean genocide. They don't mean killing thousands and millions of Israeli Jews. But when Jews hear it, what they hear is Juden raus, Jews out. And that's how they take it. And I understand political slogans are complicated. When a protest movement used the slogan, defund the police, what they meant was reallocate resources into social work and into uh, communal development. And what people heard was, fire all the police officers, close the police departments. You don't always get to decide what people hear. One of the first lessons in therapy is you say something and then the therapist asks your partner, what did they say? What did it mean to you? You learn to hear how your words hit other people. And so if the goal is to move things forward, then you have to find some common ground. Even the protests that want a ceasefire, Israel sees as an existential threat because they see if they don't get Hamas, if they don't cut out that cancer, it will come back to kill them again. And if they cannot remove that threat of Hamas, you want them gone, or you don't care enough, or your morals are more important than their lives. A third threat to Israel. Does Israel have a future? Six months ago, they were still asking that question because of the battles between the political right and the political left over what kind of democracy they would have. It's been paused with the military crisis. There are no protests and there's no progress on any judicial reform. That's not going anywhere. But that risk I mentioned at Yom Kippur of suicide by civil war, it's still there. We see in the West Bank settlers sometimes marauding, attacking Palestinians. We see Netanyahu casting blame against the protest movement as if they were in league with Iran and then deleting that tweet when he gets too much flack, but he said it. We don't know what will happen after in Gaza or in the West Bank. Even in Israel right now, there's an internal hunt for terrorist sympathizers. And the police are investigating willy-nilly anybody who said anything positive about Palestinians or even maybe who, someone who said something about a ceasefire because that's an enemy of the state. Now, there are some Israeli efforts of coexistence, Jews and Arabs, Jews and Muslims doing things together, having meetings, having protest meetings, having study sessions, having personal encounters, that's happening now too. It's not all one way or the other. But the question remains, what if Israelis lose confidence in the project of Israel? If they say they're always gonna hate us, they're always going to bomb us, will we ever, as Herzl promised, die peacefully in our own homes instead of the way we died on October 7th? One of the last major emigration waves from Israel took place after the Yom Kippur War in 1973. There was a, a, a national malaise, and so thousands of Jews chose to leave because they, they felt their life wasn't there. They, they didn't believe in the project anymore. Right now, there are hundreds of thousands of Israelis living outside of Israel. Thousands rushed back to serve in the reserves during this crisis. You saw the flights of people. They had, I think they had 110 or 115 percent turnout from the reserve call-up that they made. But in the long run, 
how many will get back on those planes? Or how many will get on those planes and find somewhere else? And how many will really return to those homes next to the Gaza Strip and along the Lebanon border? Because after all, if you give up 15% of your territory, what does that mean for this project of the state? Of course, the next 15% is the next to come. So Israel faces these existential fears, their position in the world, the possibility of their future, and right in front of them, this multi-front war. But we in diaspora have our fears too. We've seen the stories on the news. We've read the accounts. We've seen anecdotal messages on Facebook and on Twitter, or X. We hear all about rising anti-Semitism. If you subscribe to any Jewish news media publication, you are getting emails two and three times a day highlighting rising anti-Semitism, rising anti-Semitism. Aside from the justification of Hamas atrocities, which we've talked about, there's the genuine anti-Semitism of personal insults, of building vandalism, targeting Jewish institutions and individuals, and not just from their Israeli connections. It's been a synagogue sometimes, no matter what sign they have in front of them. There's the tearing down of the pictures of the hostages, because they must be crisis actors, it can't be real. You heard the story of the threats at Cornell to shoot up the Jewish center there, and personal confrontations in protests or simply on college campuses or on the streets. In the United Kingdom, they have a national organization called the Community Security Trust, and they published their one month statistics earlier this week. In that month, from October 7th to November 7th, they reported 1,124 anti-Semitic incidents. This is a 500% increase from the same period in 2022. There were only 183 a year ago, now there's 1,100. But they broke it down by the type of incident, and this is important to hear. 1,124 anti-Semitic incidents, 55 assaults, 112 threats, and 880 incidents of verbal abuse, graffiti, property damage, hate mail, or online abuse. 55 assaults is not nothing. But it's not a thousand assaults. It's different. Every Facebook post I've ever put on my page or our International Institute page or the Kol Hadash Facebook page that's about Israel gets nasty comments. Now, if Jeremy and I are on our game, we find them, we delete them, we block the users, you know, we clean it up so you don't have to see it. But it happens. And the more we promote the post to the general public, the more people feel the need to comment on it. And sometimes, by the way, we'll post something about klezmer music, and they'll say, Israel is fascist. So that happens. And what's, what's the cost of making a nasty Facebook comment? What, what effort does it take? It's, it's nothing. And that's been out there, and that's been out there for months. It has nothing to do with the current crisis. Maybe they're a little bit more emboldened. So how we count the statistics, what we react to makes a difference. Again, that 55 assaults is probably up from a year ago. The online abuse, unfortunately, that's the noise for the world we live in. You hear the phrase, it's Kristallnacht all over again, right? Kristallnacht was this week, November 9th to 10th, 1938. But we have to remember the numbers. What happened in Israel on October 7th, that was a Kristallnacht. What happened in Cornell was not. Even what happened in Montreal, where there were a couple of synagogues that had a Molotov cocktail thrown against them, that's not Kristallnacht. On Kristallnacht, 267 synagogues were destroyed in one night. Over 90 Jews were killed, 30,000 were arrested by the government and sent to concentration camps. It was 10% of the Jewish German population in 1938. There would be 600,000 Jews being arrested in America. Nothing like that. Nothing close to that scale. When we have a problem, guess who we call? The police, the government. They're the ones, when we're afraid, we call them. When we have an anti-Semitic incident, we report it to the police, and we don't expect them to arrest us. That's a big difference. Just two weeks ago, I got a call from the chief of Bannockburn Police 
to come over and visit our building to get to meet me and to talk about what's been going on. He called me to find out what's happening. Doesn't look very Jewish if I can say so. Um, it's not his personal experience. It doesn't matter. We are citizens of his area that he's responsible for. So we are not alone. It is not Kristallnacht all over again. Those Cornell University threats, within two days, the suspect was erect, arrested. And the, the school absolutely supported the Jewish population. They canceled classes that Friday so people could have a day to get their mental health back. You know, the irony is, this time has also seen a great rise in anti-Muslim activity, anti-Arab activity too. You, you heard that terrible story in Illinois with the landlord that stabbed the mother and the child, killing the child. I mean, horrific. I was on a security call recently for people who had applied to grants to the state of Illinois, and we were learning how to apply for the money to get the money. It's only been nine months since we applied for the grant, and now we're finally figuring out how to get the money. One third of the organizations on the call were Jewish, but I would bet about one third of the organizations on the call were Muslim or serving an Arabic speaking population. And they have just as much of a need of armed security as we do to make them feel safe and to deal with the verbal threats, the comments on Facebook, sometimes the vandalism, the graffiti, the same kind of challenges that we're facing too. Now, I do not want to minimize how American Jews are feeling. I don't want to minimize the real events that have happened or what it feels like on some college campuses or some online spaces. It's real. I just want us to have some historical perspective, to not have that allergy runaway, and understand that we are in a very different place in America in 2023. The spouse of the vice president is Jewish, as are the grandchildren of the previous president. And on every level of government, we have either people or people married to people who are part of our family. It is absolutely worse now than it was a month ago. And words can become deeds as feelings get more intense. Now, if I say it could still get way, way worse, does that make you feel better? But it's true. Second existential fear we face, is there a Jewish future in the diaspora? Can we trust our neighbors? Can we trust the police, the courts, our political leader, leaders, the public square, including social media as a public square? Do I need to buy a gun? Do I need to take a self-defense class because they're coming for me? Do I avoid public protests as Jews, lest there be confrontations with those supporting Palestinians? Do I attend services in person or do I stay online only? Do I go to the rally in, Israel, uh, in Washington, D.C., taking place next Tuesday on November 14th? There's a national rally to support Israel I'll talk about in a moment. Do I go there or am I afraid? And this is, again, not idle. There are pieces of evidence to support fear. You might have heard about a plot in Brazil that was foiled to bomb a Jewish community there by Hezbollah auxiliaries based in Brazil. It's real and it's terrifying. It echoes the bombing of the Jewish Community Center in Argentina in 1994 that killed 85, wounded 300. Guess what? Hezbollah and Iran were behind that one too in 1994. There was a flight from Israel that landed in Dagestan in Russia and a mob came to beat on the doors and look for who has a Jewish face and who has an Israeli passport. Fortunately, the Israelis traveling had Russian passports that they could use to get out of the threat, but it was a lynch mob. And I mentioned the case in Montreal as well with the firebomb against the synagogue door. Now again, this is a major difference in scale from the Holocaust or the Tsarist pogroms. Those killed thousands and millions of people. And remember the immune response. An online comment is very different from in-person vandalism. And that's very different from a face-to-face -face confrontation. And that's very different from physical violence that's not just words. And that's very different from a political movement designed to oppress or to expel Jews. So many times in the last 10 years, I've seen a post about politics or Jewish life that said, and so it begins, dot, dot, dot. It begins, dot, dot, dot. 
It begins. Well, if it begins and keeps beginning all the time, when does it actually begin? I don't know that it's begun. I doubt it will ever begin. There are thousands of American Jews married to people of other heritage and identity. We work with non-Jewish Americans. We live near them. We socialize with them. We play in sports leagues and community orchestras with them. We share citizenship with them. We serve in the armed forces with them. The vast majority of Congress people supporting Israel today are not Jewish. The vast majority condemning anti-Semitism are not Jewish. We are not alone, as scary as this moment may be. And so we need to take reasonable steps. If armed security makes sense, then we do it. But we live our life with courage and with conviction. But the biggest threat we face, it's that wolf inside the house, you know? It's the enemy inside the house. It's the fear of the enemy inside the house. It's that fear of our own people. The title of tonight's program was Amechad, One People. Now, is that reality or is that fantasy <laughs> or just an aspiration? On uh, Halloween, the president of the American Jewish University sent out a message, posted an uh, article on his blog, and sent it out to all of the people on their email subscription list, saying that the call of the Union for Reform Judaism for a humanitarian pause meant they were sympathizing with the enemy. I didn't think it would take this long, and sure enough, here they are, the idiots who are sympathizing with the enemy. Now, two days later, in the same publication, the head of the Union for Reform Judaism wrote a rebuttal saying, no, actually, here's why we're doing what we're doing. You get Jewish groups calling for a ceasefire, like Jewish Voice for Peace or Not In My Name. You get those who want a humanitarian pause, like the URJ or like President Biden has talked about. And you get those who promote prosecuting the war to destroy Hamas no matter what happens. And that's the AJU president and some other voices like that op-ed writer. Now, are all three of those options legitimate Jewish choices? Are all three of their proponents legitimate Jews doing legitimate Judaism? When this March on Washington was announced just last week, actually, I think the beginning of this week, the question was, on November 14th, will progressive Jews be comfortable there? Because it's the Jewish establishment calling the march, the Jewish Federations of North America, the Council of Presidents of major Jewish organizations. I'm on a progressive rabbi's listserv. And so a lot of questions came up. Who's going to be there? Are you going to be there? Are our people going to be there? Are we in danger going to this rally and saying Palestinian lives matter too? Are we going to be welcome there? The rally said that it was for Israel, for releasing the hostages, and against anti-Semitism. Now, if you come there and it's a rally for Israel, what are the speakers going to say? They might say things you like. They might say things that are beyond what you would say. And does being there endorse what they're saying? Or are you supporting one of the three goals or two of the three goals? I mean, who's going to be for anti-Semitism? in the Jewish community. Can this mean anything Israel does we support? Can it mean multiple things at the same rally? And what does it mean to be out of the consensus in a broad Jewish communal setting? Several years ago, Kol Hadash staffed a booth at a Jewish culture festival in the Chicago area, and we were a little nervous about what the reception would be. We knew that there were more traditional Jews that come to this event and, you know, to the very traditional end of things. We happened to be stationed next to an organization called Keshet, which advocates for LGBTQ inclusion in Jewish life. And we were sort of commiserating with each other, like, who's going to get more flack between the two of us? And then across the aisle from us was a booth for an organization called Not In My Name, which is supporting Palestinian rights. They got all the flack. Nobody yelled at us. That was the uh, red flag in front of the bull, so to speak. This is an area where people do feel it's life and death. You're with us or you're against us, and if you're doing it wrong, you're out. Now, I will say there is an old Jewish tradition of telling other Jews you're doing it wrong. 
this goes back a long, read the Bible, it's all over the place, medieval Jewish history, modern Jewish history, one of the oldest Jewish traditions, you're doing it wrong. Now when the question was whether your dairy products were kosher enough, or if you lit Shabbat candles at exactly the right time, it's low stakes, right? When the disagreement is between choosing a ceasefire that could let the Hamas cancer survive to come back and kill more Israelis, or choosing unrelenting bombing that could destroy Israel's moral legitimacy along with thousands of civilians, or choosing a temporary humanitarian pause to split the difference, which might thread the needle and be successful, or might fail with both disasters where you kill lots of civilians and you let Hamas live. Well, these are high stakes. Politics and morality and strategy and life and death and the future of Israel and the future of the Jewish people all over the world. These are existential questions of war and peace, of life and death, of terrorism and hostages, morality and violence. These are the questions that we face 30 days after the disaster of October 7th. We'll face these questions for the next 30 days and probably 30 days after that too. To end with Ecclesiastes, moving on to chapter eight. He contemplates the experience of disaster, that experience outside of the normal order of things. And he asks a key question. There is a time for every experience, including doom, for a person's calamity overwhelms them. Indeed, they do not know what is to happen, even when it is on the point of happening. And who can tell them what will happen after? What comes next? Well, it will depend on what we do now and how we face these storms. Even if it is worse today than we ever imagined it could be when we fell asleep on October 6th, it's not yet as bad as we fear. If we can find some consensus and work together on shared goals, it doesn't have to be. <laughs>